A very good morning to all. Glad that you can be with us again. We're going to begin with our pre-worship singing. And this is a song that actually is, it began life as a poem. And then it became a song that really took off when uh, Mahalia Jackson sang it. <laughs> and the song is, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Uh, those who are older generation will perhaps uh, know this song, be familiar. But here is a really beautiful song. You know, we, we're talking about having certainty of faith. You see, the person who wrote this song, Mrs. Martin uh, and, and husband, were both people who loved the Lord, and you know, they would often go and visit people who are not well you know, to encourage their hearts, right, and, and things like that. And so you know, there was a friend, a, a, a friends that they were not well, that this is a Christian couple that loved the Lord, and a husband has been crippled by, uh, by, an, by an illness. And she herself was getting on and there were difficulties. So this couple went to go and wanted to bring some encouragement. And now, she went and said, well, you know, I just felt for her. And it happened the other way around. She wanted to encourage this couple, but this couple encouraged her. And that's how the song was written. And this is a couple, and to them, their faith was not shaken by the, you know, the problems they were going through in life. See, a lot of the time, we talk about faith in God. At the moment we lose our health, we begin, that faith can be shaken. Now, this couple, the, the dear lady said to her, and said, you know, God's eyes are over watching the sparrows, and God will watch over us. You just don't worry. Now, here is a person who's not well telling the person who's trying to encourage her not to worry. How does that work out? And there, the certainty of her faith just inspired her to write this poem. Now, where we talk about, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? Meaning you want to die. Right? No, look at this. When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. This poem was actually a reflection of the faith of her friend. That certainty of faith is very much like Job's faith. Though He may slay me, I will trust Him. Well, that is an, a wonderful certainty of faith. Well, that's why I chose this song. And, you know, not just because someone famous sang it, but I like the certainty of the words that is there, of the person who wrote it, of the person who was meant to be encouraged. Well, let's, let's be encouraged this morning to find that same sense of certainty as many have found in their faith in Christ too. May this song encourage our heart. Okay, now there are not many sparrows in WA. I don't know whether they're sparrows. I've never encountered one. But, you know, this small bird, Christmas Island, they're sparrows. They're from Java and that. So they're small birds. But over in WA, we have the, you know, a, 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 those small birds, the willy wagtail. And uh, that's a small bird. And it's just nice sometimes they come to the house uh, just outside. And you just think, not just of the song, of what the Lord says, how God would care for these little ones how the Father would care for this little one. You know what? Let's not worry. Let's look up. The Lord will care. The Lord watches over His own. Okay? Well, let's sing this together.
so good to have this kind of certainty. And that's our challenge for this worship, for this series of messages that we are looking at, is to find that certainty in life. That find that certainty in our faith in God. And that would be, it will make all the difference in a very uncertain world we live in today. Well, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's house. It's good to be here in the Lord's house uh, once again this Sunday. Um, And the first thing I just want to uh, say is to ask, um, I guess, for you to to excuse me uh, for this thing here, you know, this sort of resemblance of a moustache here. Um, It's not, not a fashion statement. It's not a new standard I'm setting for the chair people out here. But it is to raise a good cause uh, raise money for a good cause of, of men's health in the workplace, you know, the month of November. November is now Movember. So you have to excuse me with that um, and forgive me. Not even my Scottish jeans can make this moustache look any better. <laughs> but more importantly, we're here in the Lord's house. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much that we can be in your house this morning. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us, for the word that you give to us, for your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the certainty that we can find in faith in him. Lord, we just thank you that, uh, that we are able to worship you, and we ask that all of this worship and praise may truly honor your name this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, during the week, my, my six-year-old son was uh, taught about Remembrance Day. Of course, it was Remembrance Day on the 11th of November. You know, and each year on the 11th of November at 11 a.m. Um, around the world, um, everyone stops to pause and remember World War I and also the sacrifices of all of those who have fought for our freedoms. Grow- growing up in Australia myself, it's something that, you know, this is something the country actually does quite well. Um, It remembers the armed forces and the sacrifices made. Um, There is recognition, there's a sense of respect, there's thankfulness, gratefulness for these sacrifices. Because it's good to remember, it's good to recognize, it's good to teach our kids to do the same. And in doing so, you know, you can over time cultivate a heart of gratefulness and thankfulness. King David, well, he cultivated this heart. He remembered the Lord's goodness, how the Lord had delivered him, and, uh, and he writes about his approach to worship when he thinks about all of these things. And he says in Psalm 100, he says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, 
and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name, for the Lord is good. You know, we, we come before the Lord this morning. Uh, may we be conscious that we are indeed in his house. May we go one step further and recall, remember his goodness. And may we be able to praise him with a heart full of thankfulness. Our first hymn this morning is entitled, We Praise Thee, O God, Our Redeemer. May we take this up, may we, as, do, as we doing so, as we open in worship, let us think about the Lord's goodness and may we praise his holy name this morning. Let us sing together. Well, the theme that we've been studying for the month, or this month, is taken from the Gospel of Luke, and it's about having certainty in the knowledge of our faith. You know, having certainty is important. It's an important life principle. We need it, and without it, we can be anxious, we can have fears, and our, life, our life's direction can sway easily. You know, we need confidence and we need certainty, this is for sure. You know, in the world, in the world of business, um, this is also true. You know, certainty is important. You could have a, a leader in business who inspires confidence, who sets the direction, um, and by doing so, the company can, th can thrive, it can succeed, and the business can move towards success. People will then follow these leaders because they know they've got confidence, they've got certainty in that leadership. But then the reverse is true because you can also have people or leaders who don't necessarily have integrity, maybe, who don't necessarily inspire confidence. You know, people may follow them for a while, but after that, you know, they'll lose their way and the business and the people would be poorer for it. I mean, these are basic facts. But in life, you know, this is, this is our choice. We have to choose whom we would follow. We have to choose and reflect on whom is leading us, you know, and, and where they are leading us to, and whether we have certainty in that leadership. When it comes to our God, we can have certainty. In Psalm 100, it goes on to say, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Our Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and he is a God of truth. We can rely on this truth. We can rely on his mercy. We can absolutely rely on his promises to lead us. When it comes to obtaining certainty and assurance, the onus is on us to seek out the Lord, to find this truth. If we seek, we will, of course, find our next hymn is written by the wonderful Fanny Crosby, um, hymn writer Fanny Crosby. You know, she did not even need her eyesight to be certain about her faith in the Lord.
But through her life and her experiences, she can speak of a wonderful faith in the Lord that is vibrant and extremely real. In another of her hymns, she speaks about a blessed assurance that she finds in the Lord. But in this hymn that we're about to sing, she speaks about how the Lord has led her all the way throughout her life and how she cannot even doubt his tender mercies. You know how wonderful it is when you read the words that she writes. Um, you know, this is someone who is certain about her faith and she's certain about what the Lord has done for her in her life. Let us find this certainty and let us rise and let us take up this hymn together. All the way my Saviour leads me. be seated, and I'll uh, hand this time to Pastor Chris. The topic that we have taken for our study in our worship service, this will take us to Christmas, is on the topic of certainty. I think, you know, the times we live in today we, you know, this is something that we know we want to, to have, right? Um, I think we look at the, the world and what's going on with the pandemic. We are, we, we are looking for more. You know, what are we looking for? We want to look for certainty. Will this vaccine give us certainty? Will this medication give us certainty? Will this particular uh, you know, way give us certainty? And to be very frank, nobody has great certainty. No country has great certainty. Every country is trying its best. Right? And then they realize that you know, even, even for Singapore, with the medical practices that they have, with the strictness that they have, with the process that they have, uh, you know, as it comes, you know, it, they, they hope that these things will, will, will help them into opening up. Suddenly, they are seeing case rising again. So what do you do? Well, not, not to give up on everything. You've know, you got to keep working at it. Okay? So we mustn't think this whole idea of certainty is, I've obtained it. There will be things, there will be times where we get knocked back. We've got to go back. Now, am I certain? 
Now, we are, of course, looking with reference to our faith in God, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we take a look at the Gospel of Luke, actually. This is where it comes from. Okay? So, chapter 1 of Luke, and the word certainty is brought up by Luke. And we're going to take a careful study of this. How can we find that certainty, perhaps for some? For others, it's like a regaining of certainty. And yet others, I want greater certainty. Because perhaps you're facing life challenges, you could be facing an illness, whatever it is. Okay? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we will take this up. Our Father, we thank you that we have the Gospels to read. And Luke, in particular, wrote about this certainty. And we ask that you would help us to do our part, to pay attention, to examine, to learn what we can, that we may be able to find a greater sense of certainty in our faith too. We ask that you would bless our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now we, you know, when we begin, when we start out in life, there is always, and you don't have a great sense of certainty in anything. You start out with business, you don't know whether you will succeed or not. You've got to wait till the first year is over. Is there still cash? Right? You've you got to see whether you can uh, turn it around. And then after a while, okay, now you establish your business. Are you a bit more certain? Right? Those who are university, they finish, you know, many of them are not certain whether they get a job or not. And, okay, now that I get a job, you know, what am I looking for? Well, a, a certainty that whether I can actually keep my job. So we keep on working at it. We talk about certainty in life. But what about faith? How come when it comes to faith, we don't want to find certainty? Even if there's so many doubts, we sort of like, let it go. You, know, you can have like, like, let it go. So many plague with doubts and you don't deal with it. And to me, I find that most strange. Right? If it is something that is important to you, you would want to be certain about. Isn't it? As certain as you possibly can. Anyway, isn't it? Now, we come to this in chapter 1 and verse 4, is what this author, Luke, now he's a physician by profession who came to faith in Christ, who grew in his knowledge, who has perfect understanding, and then he can now contribute and to help others find certainty. And he writes to this uh, person called Theophilus. Right? So he addresses him as most excellent Theophilus. Today, the word will be your excellency. See, Luke was, when he wrote his gospel, it was not to general readership. He wrote to one person. It was for one person, right? We now benefit from it. But when he wrote this, it was directed at a person called Theophilus. And the person, we don't know much about him, but his very title will tell you he's not a commoner. Most excellent Theophilus. You do not just call anyone most excellent anything. This would be, could be a member of a royal family, now, where the gospel have reached to that level. This person is well-read. This person knows his stuff. And so when you write to someone and you want to help this person find certainty, you have better got to do your work well. Right? Every word is carefully uh, you know, thought through. And so he says to him, he's writing an orderly account to him, and this is the goal of it all, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. 
Chances are this person is a believer. So he has commenced in his faith. Right? Now, that is good. There is commencement. Now, he, how do we know the things which you have been instructed? This word instructed is where the word, word, we actually get the word catechism. So when, we, when I take catechism class, I wonder whether you know what it even is. The word catechism actually is this word. To be instructed. To know this faith to a point where you are certain of your salvation, where you are certain of faith in Jesus, and I make a response of baptism. That's what catechism is all about. So when we talk about the word catechism, or a person is catechized, is you actually say, this person has been now instructed. And you make that decision. Right? So here, he has been instructed. Good. Now, here's another thing. Do you know the certainty of the things you are instructed? Now, you know Luke is a scholar. One, not just his profession, but his Greek is not the same as other Greeks. Okay, so when you read the gospel, the Greek that John used, the Greek that Mark used, uh, even from Matthew, and then Luke compared, this is your scholar kind. He, he uses his words very skillfully the way he phrased things. The word certainty, now he could have used other ways to explain it. He uses a particular word and he puts an alpha primitive in front. An alpha primitive is, you know, you put it there, it's the alpha. It is to negate something or say there's an absence of. Now, this particular word, certainty, talks about, uh, see, it's, it's not just feeling certain. Oh no, it's, it's this verb. It's very quite graphic, quite visual. It's the idea of you are walking and you, there is, you are, you know, you are, there is a sense of security, stability that is there. Firmness that is there. Now, without the alpha primitive, this word, the idea of safalo is the idea of stumbling. You stumble and you falter and you fall. What is Luke trying to say? You have a faith that is not certain. You can stumble and fall. That is very, very possible. Now, I remember my days as a student pastor over in Singapore, and one of the things that Pastor Charlie used to do is he brings out, we go to minister to people who are shut-ins. People who... You know, they can't come to church uh, you know, because of it, uh, they are physically unable to. Usually the older folks. It could be people in hospital. So, uh, you know, uh, we will go there. Now, I remember this very, very clearly. We, we visited this man. And he was, his eyesight were failing. And so one day when he, you know, he lived in those, you know, they call them HDBs. It's like an apartment's. He went downstairs, and he fell. He hit his head, and he was hospitalized. Now, when he went back, now he recovered from it. He went back, and he said to his children, I'm not leaving this house ever again. There was a sense of fear that is in his heart that, you know, if I go out, I might fall again. I'm not going out. And he is just saying, I will just stay at home and I'm not going out. That's what stumbling can do. Where once you can be certain and you fall and you injure yourself and then suddenly whatever certainty you had, you're, you feel you are certain about, gone. And it can be affected. You affect your confidence. You, your fear literally overwhelms you. Now, I remember going there and, you know, there, uh, watching how 
Pastor Charlie would share with him uh, about faith. He didn't know the Lord. And so, uh, bit by bit, uh, you know, it was hard for me because they were speaking in a dialect in, in Teochew. So I had delayed reaction. So somebody was translate and as it was going on. And that was an interesting uh, thing there. And, you know, you know sharing with him uh, from Isaiah, from what God said, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. Now, here is a man who doesn't know the Lord, who is not of a Christian faith, and he says, is this God for real? He said, okay, you are a pastor. You must be very certain about your God. You must be very certain about your faith. And if you say this is real, you know, you're a very nice man. You, are very, you care for my family. This was the, the children were church members. You know what? I, I would like to believe in the same God. Now, back and forth, if, if, over a few weeks, and I must tell you, remember this guy, he has said, I'm not ever going to get out of the house. There's this sense of fear in his heart. So one day when we went there, I said, look at that, uh, you know, greeted him the usual, hello uncle, how are you today? You know what he was doing? Now, the daughter was stunned. He said, my father has given up on reading. He used to like to read Chinese newspaper. Every day he reads a Chinese newspaper. He's just given up because he's so discouraged. I can't see any ball. There's no point. He was using magnifying glass and reading Isaiah in Chinese. I see. Wow, what? He was just making the effort. And, he, and the, the daughter said, you know, my dad has some, went downstairs, went walk around. He is not afraid. Fear not, I am with you. He took that to heart. I'm your God. I will uphold you. I would like this to be my God. Here is a man who was so uncertain about many things. And there, now, uh, with a great sense of certainty, that uh, God is with him. I'm not afraid, and I want to know a little bit more about this God. Now, remember, I was a student pastor, and I was just thinking, wow, that is amazing. I would like that kind of certainty too. See, it's not in just scholarship. It's in whether this faith of ours, the word that is there, can we be certain in the things we have been instructed? We may be instructed in it, but are we certain? Certainty is something else. Right? So when Luke wrote what he did, it is to help Theophilus, not just commence in faith, a lot of people comment. After a while, they just stop. And when problems in life catch up, they become more and more uncertain about their faith. Whether they, you know, whatever they thought faith was, are they even certain anymore? Now, the challenge is to help this man be certain. Right? Now, that is our challenge as well. How do we find certainty? Now, the first word I would like to share with you is know your content well. Content. Faith is not blind faith. The Christian faith is anything but blind. There is tremendous, strong content that we can examine. Hence, look at the Scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures spanning thousands of years. Examine. Can we examine? You don't have to read it in Hebrew. You don't need to read the New Testament in Greek. There is plenty of content. Now, take a look at Luke. In his time, we talk about content. Okay? So he says in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have taken 
in hand to set in order a narrative of those things. Right? So he, you know, there are many, he notes, that have written a narrative about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is the focus of the narrative that we read? Right? The things which have been fulfilled among us. Now, that is significant content. The scriptures fulfilled. Now, this is something that we must appreciate. What does it mean to fulfill? Now, for us, fulfill is just, okay, when we do something, it is fulfilled. Is that complete? Right? Uh, you know, university students, what do they hope to fulfill? Uh, finish and you know, get your degree, and overseas student, you, know, you have fulfilled. Then you can now go back with joy and pride, you have finished your university degree. Right? That can be used, the word fulfilled. But when we talk about the scriptures being fulfilled, it's not the same thing. And you look at the scriptures carefully when Luke. Look at the, the things that have been fulfilled among us is not just a historical thing. It's not just something completed. Every time you look at the idea of fulfillment, and you will see this in Matthew's gospel a lot, that which has been fulfilled. That's the phrase. It's a common phrase used by them. The things that have been fulfilled. What are they talking about? Number one. There is the plan of God revealed in prophecy. Number two, there is the purpose of God given. Number three, there is the power of God to fulfill it. Man cannot fulfill it. It takes God to fulfill His own word. So when the word fulfilled is chosen, Luke communicates all three things. To me, that is significant. So when I talk about my faith in the fulfillment of the Scriptures, well, what am I examining content? The plan of God, the purpose of God, the power of God. Then I can, if I can understand this, then I can be a little bit more certain. Isn't it? In my life, in my belief, and it affects me. So when we look at fulfillment, it's not just writing, okay, this is done, this is done, this is done. This is done. What has it got to do with you? What's Christmas got to do with you? What's that which is fulfilled 2,000 years ago got to do with you? And when Luke write what he did, everything. The plan of God, the purpose of God for salvation plan salvation, His purpose in sending the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is power that is there. And hence, Luke, Paul will write, the power of God to salvation is in the gospel. You, you see this? So that's the first part where we look at, please, if we really want to find certainty, know your content well. That's a challenge. And we don't know our content. Of course we won't be certain. Know your content well. That's my task. I give myself to examine, to study, to ponder every of this. Why? I want to be very, very certain. Right? Now, here's the second thought. One is content. Now, here is another part to it. Now we read on further. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. Now we're going to take a look at this uh, today. What are these eyewitnesses and ministers of the word? How do I know this content is reliable? How do I know this content is trustworthy? Sources. And, two, uh, and Luke brought up two. Juan, 
eyewitnesses. Two ministers of the word. Now, they can be the same person. Right? What do you look for to find certainty? One, I want to know the content. Two, is there any credibility? Now, there's so much write-up out there, and people will say, and they will send it to each other, you see, the vaccine, it doesn't work, it's a hoax, it's all that. Please check the credibility before you forward it out. Facebook is not credible. Who is the source? Your friend. And we have become, our source of information becomes social media. Really? Check the credibility. Examine it. And a lot of the time we get to realize these persons are not credible people even to comment on this field. Right? So if a person wants to tell me about faith in God, first, wow, wait, wait, wait a bit. Is there any credibility? Is there credibility in what this person is talking about? So I remember once this you know, friend of mine said to me, Chris, I tell you, the Bible is false and wrong. So I said, really? Have you read it? And he said, no. <laughs> okay. You are doing a book review on a book you've never read. And then he smiled and he just realized how stupid that comment was. You're reviewing a book you've never read and you just concluded it's false. Why don't you try reading it? Then let's talk. Right. So when we look at the Scriptures, is there credibility? I tell you, I mean, whether it is today, especially the, in the ancient day, the testimony of the eyewitness is very important. Uh, right? If there is a crime scene, are there any eyewitnesses? Right? If you get into an accident, where are the eyewitnesses? To establish a truth, to establish, did this thing really happen? Now, there were many eyewitnesses. But what Luke have done is he didn't just go out and find many eyewitnesses. Are these credible eyewitnesses? Right? Now, one of which is pretty amazing. This is his own research. He took it as far. Now, he, he says this. From the beginning were I just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses. So he's not talking about eyewitnesses when Jesus began preaching. Did anyone hear him? Who are the people that heard him? He went as far as even before Jesus was born. An angel appeared to the man called Zacharias and Elizabeth. Oh, that is a very strange thing. He included their testimony here. Now, what were these people like? Take a look. Now, we talk about credibility. Luke is into credibility. So he says in verse uh, 6, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments, ordinance of the Lord, uh, uh, blameless. Now, there we have the people he would choose and select as credible eyewitnesses. Right? So we look at the scriptures and we must ask, is there credibility? This per person has a reputation for being righteous. This person has a reputation for being blameless. You don't go and find some shady eyewitness. And, right? Judas is not a good eyewitness. You are not going to include... So, out there, there is the gospel according to Judas. Uh, yeah, he may be an eyewitness, but not a credible one. He's got his own funny ideas. He's the guy that ended up betraying Jesus. And you know what? I like his eyewitness. Are you serious? So, it's not just getting eyewitnesses. Find good and credible eyewitnesses. 
Now, here is another part to it. Not just eyewitnesses here. Now, these, some of these eyewitnesses have become ministers of the Word. Now, that would tell you something. They know their stuff. These are people who have taken their faith seriously, who not just eyewitness, but they have seen Jesus for themselves. They have, been, they have understood who Jesus is. Not only that they have come to believe in Him, they have gone further and now are, you know, they acquire the skill, the knowledge and the insight to even be called ministers of the Word. Now, that would be worthwhile content to examine. Right? These people really know their stuff. I want to examine it very carefully. So that's what Luke has done. See, certainty is actually for ourselves, not, not for God. God is, whether you are certain or uncertain, it doesn't affect God one bit. God is still God. Certainty is for us to become certain of who He is, of what He has called us to, to, to do and to respond to Him. Now, I need to be certain. Is this for real? Is God real? Is Jesus real? Because if these things are real, then I I'm hold accountable to this God. One day I will stand before this God. Now, I better know this God. Right? I better be certain about this. And then, now, let me find out. Isn't it? Okay? So there we go. First, you look at the content. Two, you look at credible sources. Is this credible? Now, we take a next part. We need to actually cultivate certainty. How can we actually cultivate certainty? Now, this is where Luke, what he's doing, he's one who contributed. He's not an eyewitness. Right? Now, let's learn from him. He says, the, just as those from the beginning were eyewitnesses, uh, ministers of the word, now, here is the word, they delivered them to us. He's not an eyewitness. He's not exactly m compare himself as minister of the word. Delivered them to us. Now, to me, that is an important word. The idea of delivered them to us is actually where we get the word tradition. What do you do with tradition? Now, of course, there, there are all kinds of tradition, but they're good traditions. What do we do with traditions? You know what? We pass down traditions. We pass down certain traditions to our children. We pass down to tradition to the next generation. Because the tradition holds what is who we are as a people. Who, you know, where our past, our heritage, and all that, and we pass it down. Now, to today, you know, when the Chinese New Year comes, we will, you know, prepare special things and, you know, for our children. You know, they will get a red packet and an ang pao, and then we would tell them what it means. Because growing up in a Western country, all the traditions can be lost. So they learn certain traditions. And we hold these traditions to our heart. Are there Christian traditions? Absolutely. One of them is the celebration of Christmas. Now, why do we celebrate Christmas? Now, there, there is a tradition that we pass down. Not just Christmas trees, you know, Christmas carols. I'm, I'm not talking about those traditions. We're talking about the content of it all. We're talking about our faith. We're talking about the truths that are there, and we pass it down. Traditions are living things, not dead history. They are alive. 
So when Luke talks about they have delivered these things to us, it's not just knowledge or information. It's that life of Christ. It's the traditions of faith in itself. Hand down to them. This is what we want to do as we understand this. Right? So we change the youth worship time to 2 o'clock and suddenly a bigger group of young ones come. Good! See, what do we want to pass down to them? A tradition of faith in the Scriptures. Well, learn to read the Scriptures. Learn to love the Scriptures. This is a wonderful tradition. You don't pass it down. All you need is one generation that doesn't care for it. And you have lost it. We don't want to lose that which is valuable, that which is precious. They may not know how to appreciate it yet. Well, that is it. Every week after week, we This is our intention. This is our goal. We want to hand down, as it were, to them our faith in Christ in the form of content, in the form of certainty of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a living person. So it's not just documents. Luke saw, heard, talked to eyewitnesses, ministers of God, Now, we don't have the eyewitnesses here here today. This is what we are looking at. We, as it were, pass this down. That is our great challenge. So there is a personal certainty. There is a certainty that comes handed down to others. Right? Now, there we see Luke say, they delivered them to us. Now, what were these things? Some of these things delivered them to us. Now, we're going to take at some examples now. Okay. Now, one of them, we talk about eyewitness and we talk about ministers of the word together. An eyewitness that became a minister of the word would be a person called like Peter, for example, the apostle Peter. So let's take a look at Peter. Right? His writing is found in 1 Peter, and this is what he, sorry, 2 Peter. We'll take a look at this uh, text over here, 2 Peter 1, 16. Right? 2 Peter 1. And then verse 16, he uh, says and he writes, and he says, We do not follow cunningly devised fables, but when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Right? Now, that is Peter's contribution. He looks at the things that he is teaching. That Remember, there are many stories. These are not fables. These are not cunningly devised. We want to share with you these things that you may, one, know the power of Christ in you. Two, that you may know the coming of the Lord that you may discover for yourself the majesty of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's Peter. Right? So when we talk about what is passed down to us, these are not just nice stories, like fables, you know. Uh, All these are just stories. It is not. What is being passed down? The certainty of faith. There is power that comes from the Lord in life. The certainty and understanding must affect my life. The Lord is returned, is will return. Not if He will return, when He will return. How does that affect my life? The majesty of the Lord. Now, how does that affect my life? So, this is that contribution. Now, we turn to another. 
Okay, John's contribution. This is the Apostle John. Okay, now, John wrote. Peter wrote he had to defend. There is a certainty of faith we can, you know, have. We don't need to fall. We don't need to slip, as it were. Because there is great certainty. Right? Now, what are some of the things here that John wrote? And in 1 John chapter 1, he writes to them as an eyewitness, as a minister of the word. And so he writes these words. Now, that is really significant. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, literally, with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, meaning they, you know, here, John, another eyewitness. Now, look at the significance of the things that they have written. The life that was manifested, okay, concerning the word of life. This is Jesus. He is the word of life. The life that was manifested and we have seen, we bear witness, we declare to you that eternal life, that which was with the Father, was manifested to us, which we have seen, heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. See, this is what it contributes to us. That there may be true fellowship with each other, with a great sense of certainty, with God. So what they have written, how does it contribute to my life, to my faith? If I examine this carefully, you know, to me, what is a great, what is Fellowship, true fellowship. Not, I eat and I'm so full. And, I, and I'm, uh, that's fellowship. Yeah, I go and watch TV. Let's gather and let's watch soccer. And fellowship, in the name of fellowship. That's not fellowship. You want to talk about real fellowship? You know what will come out to, of this fellowship? There will be a little bit more you know, understanding about God. There's a bit more understanding about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what comes out of it, your joy will be full. It's refreshing. I look for this fellowship. I seek to impart this fellowship all the time. This is fellowship. It's not just a gathering around and having a chit-chat over something. Real fellowship will revive your faith, will revitalize it. The joy that can come, you become even more certain about your faith. You know what? That joy becomes full. That is contribution. So each one has its contribution. There is Peter, there is John, now there is Paul. Let's take a look at Paul. Right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, there is a wonderful contribution from Paul. And Paul writes with reference to the resurrection. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection of believer, the doctrine of resurrection is the core of the Christian faith. You've got to know this one. Certain. And be certain about it. And so Paul writes, because there were people in the church confused about this matter. Some say there's no such thing. Some say it has already happened. So Paul writes and says, verse 3, I delivered to you first of all, that which I received. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and rose again on the third day. Note, according to the Scriptures. Content. Now, is it true, backed up by the credibility of eyewitness, He was seen by Cephas, which is Peter, 
then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. The resurrection account is not just saw, seen by one or two people. 500 people saw this. And the greater part of them were present, but some have fallen asleep, meaning they have passed on. After, they were seen by James, by all the apostles, and at last, he was seen by me also, one born out of due time. So each one has their own contribution to knowledge, to understanding, to whether it's the return of Christ, the power of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the fellowship with God, and we can go on. But it's up to us. The challenge is to make it certain. There is plenty of content. It's a question of whether we want to examine it. And to see it for ourselves and then say, I am absolutely certain about my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this too now is passed down to me. I want to live it out. I want to, this is now inside me that I hope to hand down to others. That is what certainty is all about. You cannot pass down which you are uncertain. There's no content, you can't pass anything down. The challenge is to have this so much part of us you know, that we one day will see others benefit. So from one generation, an older generation, to another generation, certain, certain, absolutely certain, and then you're going to see a whole entire community truly in fellowship with God. Right? It makes all the difference. And this is something that we want to try and do. Okay? Well, think about this. Yeah? What do we look for? Content. Know your content. Give time, give effort, research it, search it out for yourself. Find out for yourself. We want to be certain about so many things. Why don't we want to be certain about our eternal being? Right? We want to be so certain about our life in, on earth. Do we not want to be certain about eternal life? Where we will go when we die? Don't we want to be absolutely you know, certain about that? I would. And this certainty it bring a lot of joy into our life, even though you know, the challenges may still be present. May this certainty be yours. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that we would be challenged to find the greater sense of certainty by first addressing all the doubts that we have not leaving them there as gaps in our faith. Help us, Lord, to do our part to, to know the content of our faith very well and to examine it and to look at it for ourselves, to test it out, as it were, until every doubt is removed and we can have absolute certainty. We ask that you would bless we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The word certainty literally means no doubts. Literally. With no doubt. That's what the alpha primitive is all about. Absent of negate. You have zero doubt. And that is a real, real wonderful, extraordinary challenge to have absolutely no doubt in what you have come to believe in. Okay? Well, we conclude this worship service with this song and hymn that encourages us to pursue this. What would you find when you have absolutely no doubt about who God is, about faith in Him, about eternal life, about the resurrection, right? Right? about all these things that we have looked at. 
He died for our sins, He rose again, and then, you know, He will one day return. What do you, what would you find? Now, this hymn encapsulates it very well. And the, word, and the phrase here is, blessed assurance. This is what you will find. It's just a sense of, ble- a state of being you know, there is just such assurance in life. That your life is in God's hands. That no matter what happens, you're not afraid. You live each day trusting, believing in your heavenly Father. Well, this is the faith of this lady, Kofani J. Crosby, who wrote this hymn. Right? Well, may we experience this in a very, very real way. Let's sing this together. Blessed assurance. Let's rise as we sing. Let's ask the Lord to bless us before we go from here. Our Father, we pray first for ourselves that we may find the greater sense of certainty in our faith in you. And we will be challenged to know the content of our faith well and to cultivate it deeply. That we may pass this on to the next generation We pray for the young ones, the young people in our midst, that as they learn your word, our heart's desire is that they will grow up to be people who have a great content of faith, that they will be certain, that they will be strong. And we ask that you would hear this, our prayer, for all of us who are here, all of us 
who are desiring and seeking this certainty of faith in you. We ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.